Ho, ho, ho. Chase ghosts. ghosts. Come and sleep. Watch out. Demons are coming. Run. Sleep. Hide. Spirits. Run. Ghosts. Ghosts. Hide. Ho, ho. Demons. Ho, ho. Ghosts. Demons are coming. Hello, my little hellhounds, and welcome to another Killer Thursday. Now, if you like these true crime episodes, then please subscribe and click the bell icon so you get notified every time I upload. If you have any stories, creepy encounters, or paranormal, then submit them to r slash home of scares and follow me on Twitter at home of scares. If you have any serial killer ideas for the next documentary then leave a comment down below now let's get into tonight's killer thursday with the angel of death and what that means Angel of Death Characteristics and Motivation The motivation for this type of criminal is variable but generally falls into one or more types of patterns. The Mercy Killer believe their victims are suffering or beyond help, though this belief may be delusional. The sadistic use their position as a way of exerting power and control over helpless victims. The malignant hero, a pattern wherein the subject endangers the victim's life in some way and then proceeds to save them. Some feign attempting resuscitation all the while knowing their victim is already dead and beyond help but hope to be seen as selflessly making an effort. In the medical field, some people with a pathological interest in the power of life and death can be attracted to medical or related professions. Killers who occupy the role of a professional carer are sometimes referred to as angels of death or angels of mercy. In this role they may kill their patients for money, for a sense of sadistic pleasure, for a belief that they are easing the patient's pain or simply because they can. In some cases, the killer claims the motive is euthanasia when it is not. The difference is that a serial killer lacks a sense of compassion towards the patient. 
which is expected in situations of euthanasia. Most murders committed by nurses are performed by lethal injection. The typical medical professional who murders kills two patients each month. A 2011 study of characterizing 70 female serial killers found that 30% of the offenders were nurses. One such killer was Nurse Toban, who admitted during her murder trial that she was sexually aroused by death. She would administer a drug mixture to patients she chose as her victims, lie in bed with them and hold them close to her body as they died. Another example is Harold Shipman, an English family doctor who made it appear that his victims died of natural causes. Between 1975 and 1998, he murdered at least 215 patients. He is suspected of having murdered 250 people. Dr. John Bodkin Adams, meanwhile, though acquitted in 1957, of the murder of one patient is believed to have killed around 163 patients in Eastbourne, England. An example of a malignant hero serial killer was Richard Angelo, who was called the Angel of Death or Angel of Mercy. Angelo devised a plan where he would inject the patient with drugs, then rush them into the room and attempt to save the patient so that he could be a hero to his patient's family. The motive of excitement from inducing a health crisis for the patient has recently been labelled as a professional version of Munchausen syndrome by proxy, a type of factitious disorder. Richard Angelo confesses to killing 25 of his patients. A number of medical murders were involved in fraud. For example, H. H. Holmes was often involved in insurance scams and confidence tricks. Harold Shipman had previous conviction for prescription fraud and forgery and he was fined £600. Beverly Allitt, English nurse who murdered four child patients. Kristen Gilbert, American nurse and convicted serial killer. Donald Harvey, American orderly and convicted serial killer. Michael Swango, American physician who poisoned over 30 patients and co-workers. Niels Hoggle, German nurse and convicted serial killer. There is a concern that legalized euthanasia 
could enable serial killers who could use euthanasia to mask murderous motives. Concern over this possibility could fuel mistrust of palliative care practitioners among the general public and mistrust of government agencies to properly oversee nursing homes. Now let's look at two of the angels of death in more detail. Harold Shipman Harold Frederick Shipman was born on the 14th of January 1946 on the Bestwood Council Estate in Nottingham, Nottinghamshire, England. The second of the three children of Harold Frederick Shipman, 12th of May 1914 to the 5th of January 1985, a lorry driver, and Vera Britton, 23rd of December 1919 to 21st of June 1963. His working class parents were devout Methodists. When growing up, Shipman was an accomplished rugby player in youth leagues. Shipman passed his 11 plus in 1957, moving to High Pavement Grammar School, Nottingham, which he left in 1964. He excelled as a distance runner and in his final year at school served as vice captain of the athletics team. Shipman was particularly close to his mother who died of lung cancer when he was aged 17. Her death came in a manner similar to what later became Shipman's own modus operandi. In the latter stages of her disease she had morphine administered at home by a doctor. Shipman witnessed his mother's pain subside despite her terminal condition until her death on 21st of June 1963. On 5th of November 1966 Shipman married Primrose May Oxtoby, the couple had four children. Shipman studied medicine at Leeds School of Medicine, University of Leeds, graduating in 1970. He began working at Pontefract General Infirmary in Pontefract, West Riding of Yorkshire and in 1974 took his first position as a general practitioner at the Abraham Ormerod Medical Centre in Todd Morden. In the following year he was caught forging prescriptions of pethidine Demerol for his own use. Shipman was fined £600 and briefly attended a drug rehabilitation clinic in York. He became a GP at the Donnybrook Medical Centre in Hyde near Manchester in 1977. 
Shipman continued working as a GP in Hyde throughout the 80s and established his own surgery at 21 Market Street in 1993, becoming a respected member of the community. In 1983, he was interviewed in an edition of the Granada television documentary World in Action on how the mentally ill should be treated in the community. A year after his conviction, the interview was rebroadcast on Tonight with Trevor MacDonald. Detection in March 1998 prompted by Deborah Massey from Frank Massey and Sons Funeral Parlour Linda Reynolds of the Brook Surgery in Hyde expressed concerns to John Pollard the coroner for the South Manchester district about the high death rate among Shipman's patients. In particular, she was concerned about the large number of cremation forms for elderly women that he had needed countersigned. Police were unable to find sufficient evidence to bring charges and closed the investigation on 17th of April. The Shipman inquiry later blamed the police for assigning inexperienced officers to the case. After the investigation was closed, Shipman killed three more people. In August, taxi driver John Shaw told the police that he suspected Shipman of murdering 21 patients. Shaw became suspicious as many of the elderly customers he took to the hospital who seemed to be in good health died in Shipman's care. Shipman's last victim was Kathleen Grundy who was found dead at her home on 24th of June 1998. Shipman was the last person to see her alive. He later signed her death certificate, recording the cause of death as old age. Grundy's daughter, lawyer Angela Woodruff, became concerned when solicitor Brian Burgess informed her that a will had been made apparently by her mother with doubts about its authenticity the will excluded Woodruff and her children but left £386,000 to Shipman at Burgess urging Woodruff went to the police who began an investigation. Grundy's body was exhumed and found to contain traces of diamorphine heroin often used for pain control in terminal cancer patients. Shipman claimed that Grundy had been an addict and showed them comments he had written to that effect in his computerized medical journal. However, examination of his computer showed that they were written after her death. Shipman was arrested on September the 7th, 1998 
and was found to own a brother typewriter of the kind used to make the forged will. The police investigated other deaths Shipman had certified and investigated 15 specimen cases. They discovered a pattern of his administering lethal doses of diamorphine, signing patients' death certificates and then falsifying medical records to indicate that they had been in poor health. Prescription for Murder, a 2000 book by journalist Brian Whittle and Jean Ritchie suggested that the shipman forged the will either because he wanted to be caught, because his life was out of control, or because he planned to retire at 55 and leave the UK. In 2003, David Spielgerhalter suggested that statistical monitoring could have led to an alarm being raised at the end of 1996 when there were 67 excess deaths in females aged over 65 years compared with 119 by 1998. Trial and Imprisonment Shipman's trial began at Preston Crown Court on 5th of October 1999. He was charged with the murders of 15 women by lethal injections of diamorphine all between 1995 and 1998. Mary West, Irene Turner, Lizzie Adams, Jean Lilly, Ivy Lomas, Muriel Grimshaw, Mary Quinn, Kathleen Wagstaff, Bianca Pomfrey, Nora Nuttall, Pamela Hiller, Maureen Ward, Winifred Meller, Joan Malia, Kathleen Grundy. His legal representatives tried unsuccessfully to have the Grundy case tried separately from the others as a motive was shown by the alleged forgery of Grundy's will. On 31st of January 2000, after six days of deliberation, the jury found Shipman guilty of 15 counts of murder and one count of forgery. Mr. Justice Forbes subsequently sentenced Shipman to life imprisonment on all 15 counts of murder with a recommendation that he never be released to be served concurrently with a sentence of four years for forging Grundy's will. On 11th of February, ten days after his conviction, Shipman was struck off by the General Medical Council, GMC. Two years later, Home Secretary David Blunkett confirmed the judge's whole life tariff just months before British government ministers lost their power to set minimum terms for prisoners. 
while authorities could have brought many additional charges they concluded that a fair hearing would be impossible in view of the enormous publicity surrounding the original trial. Furthermore, the 15 life sentences already handed down rendered further litigation unnecessary. Shipman consistently denied his guilt, disputing the scientific evidence against him. He never made any public statements about his actions. Shipman's wife, Primrose, steadfastly maintained her husband's innocence, even after his conviction. Shipman is the only doctor in the history of British medicine found guilty of murdering his patients. John Bodkin Adams was charged in 1957 with murdering a patient amid rumours he had killed dozens more over a 10 year period and possibly provided the role model for Shipman. However, he was acquitted. Historian Pamela Cullen has argued that because of Adam's acquittal, there was no impetuous to examine the flaws in the British legal system until the Shipman case. Death. Shipman hanged himself in his cell at Wakefield Prison at 6.20 a.m. on the 13th of January 2004 on the eve of his 58th birthday and was pronounced dead at 8.10 a.m. A statement from Her Majesty's Prison Service indicated that Shipman had hanged himself from the window bars of his cell using bed sheets. After Shipman's death, his body was taken to the mortuary at the Medico Legal Center for a post-mortem examination. West Yorkshire Coroner David Hinchcliffe eventually released the body to the family after an inquest was opened and adjourned shortly after. Some of the victims' families said they felt cheated, as Shipman's suicide meant they would never have the satisfaction of his confession, nor answers to why he committed his crimes. Home Secretary David Blunkett noted the celebration was tempting, saying you wake up and you receive a call telling you Shipman has topped himself and you think is it too early to open a bottle and then you discover that everybody's very upset that he's done it. Shipman's death divided national newspapers with the Daily Mirror branding him a cold coward and condemning the prison service for allowing his suicide to happen. However, the Sun ran celebratory front page headline, Ship Ship Hooray. The Independent called for the inquiry into Shipman's suicide to look more widely at the state of Britain's prisons, as well as the welfare of inmates. In The Guardian, an article by General Sir David Ramsbotham, who had formerly served as her, Ma as her Majesty's Chief Inspector of Prisons, suggested that the whole life sentencing to be replaced by indefinite sentencing, for this would give at least prisoners the hope of eventual release 
and reduce the risk of their ending their lives by suicide as well as making their management easier for prison officials. Now, my little hellhounds, if you've made it this far, then please consider subscribing and clicking that bell. Let's get on to the next angel of death. Jane Topan Jane Topan was born Honora Kelly on March 31st 1954 the daughter of Irish immigrants her mother Bridget Kelly died of tuberculosis when she was very young her father Peter Kelly was well known as an eccentric and abusive alcoholic nicknamed by those who knew him Kelly the crack as in crack pot in later years Kelly became the source of many local rumors concerning his supposed insanity the most popular one being that his madness finally drove him to sew his own eyelids closed while working as a tailor in 1860 only a few years after his wife's death Kelly took his two youngest children eight years old Delia Josephine and six years old Honora to the Boston Female Asylum an orphanage for indigent female children Kelly surrendered the two girls never to see them again documents from the asylum note that they were rescued from a very miserable home no records exist of Delia and Honora's experience during their time in the asylum but report reportedly Delia became a prostitute while their older sister Nelly who was not committed to the orphanage was committed to an insane asylum in November 1862 less than two years after her father had left them Honora Kelly was placed as an indentured servant in the home of Mrs Anne C Topan of Lowell Massachusetts though never formally adopted by the Topans Honora took on the surname of her benefactors and eventually became known as Topan the original Topan family already had a daughter Elizabeth with whom Honora was on good terms <laughs> motives an article in the Hoosier State Chronicles published shortly after Topan's arrest reported that she would fondle her victims as they died and attempt 
to see the inner workings of their souls through their eyes. Under questioning, Taipan stated that she derived a sexual thrill from patients being near death, coming back to life and then dying again. Taipan administered a drug mixture to the patients she chose as her victims, lay with them and held them close as they died. Topan is often considered an angel of death, a type of serial killer who takes on a caretaker role and attacks the vulnerable and dependent, though she also murdered for seemingly more personal reasons, such as in the case of the Davis family, it is possible Topan was also motivated by jealousy. In the case of the murder of her foster sister, she later described her motivation as a paralysis, a thought and reason, a strong urge to poison. Topan used poison for more than just murder, reportedly poisoning a housekeeper just enough so that she appeared drunk in order to steal her job and kill the family. She even poisoned herself to evoke the sympathy of men she was caught in. In 1885, Topan began training to be a nurse at Cambridge Hospital, unlike her early years, where she was described as brilliant and terrible. At the hospital, she was well liked, bright and friendly, evoking the nickname Jolly Jane. Once Topan became close with the patients, she picked her favourite ones. The patients were normally elderly and very sick. During her residency, Topan used her patients as guinea pigs in experiments with morphine and atropine. She altered their prescribed dosages to see what it did to their nervous systems. However, she spent considerable time alone with patients, making up fake charts and medicating them to drift in and out of consciousness and even getting into bed with them. Topan was recommended for the prestigious Massachusetts General Hospital. In 1889, there she claimed several more victims before being fired the following year. She briefly returned to Cambridge but was soon dismissed for administering opiates recklessly. Topan then began a career as a private nurse and flourished despite complaints of petty theft. Topan began her poisoning spree in earnest in 1895 by killing her landlord, Israel Dunham and his wife in 1899. She killed her foster sister, Elizabeth, with a dose of strychnine. In 1901, Topan moved in with the elderly Alden Davis and his family in Katumet to take care of him after the death of his wife, Matty, whom Topan had murdered. 
Within weeks, she killed Davis, his sister Edna, and two of his daughters, Minnie and Genevieve. The surviving members of the Davis family ordered a toxicology exam on Alden Davis, youngest daughter, Minnie. The report found that she had been poisoned and local authorities assigned a police detail on Topan to watch her. On October 29th, 1901, she was arrested for murder by 1902. She had confessed to 31 murders. Soon after the trial, one of William Randolph Hearst's newspapers, the New York Journal printed what was purported to be Topan's confession to her lawyer claiming that she had killed more than 31 people and that she wanted the jury to find her sane so she could eventually have a chance at being released. Topan insisted upon her own sanity in court, claiming that she could not be insane if she knew what she was doing and knew that it was wrong, but nonetheless she was declared insane and committed on June 23rd. Barnstable County Courthouse. She was found not guilty by reason of insanity and committed for life in the Taunton Insane Hospital. little hellhounds and that's it for tonight's killer thursday please remember to subscribe click the bell icon and like the video really helps the channel now good night my little hellhounds Sleep tight. <laughs>